G'day guys, welcome back to Next Level Adventures. I'm Ryan and today we're going to be doing a very first here on the channel. Today we're going to be doing a behind the scenes trip planning kind of video for you guys as we prepare ourselves for two weeks off the grid. I'm going to update you guys a little bit on the plan because it's sort of changed since the last time I mentioned it. We're going to be running through the Pajero and Jake's Navarra fully packed so maybe anyone out there who's looking at doing something like this can get an idea of how we're packed for two weeks how we prep all of our food all that sort of stuff we're going to go shopping and we're also going to give you guys at the very end a detailed run through of our planned itinerary now make sure you stick around and subscribe because after this trip we'll be doing an update video on all of this stuff to see how it went and what we would change and all those sort of things so anyway Let's get stuck right into this one, giving you guys a rundown of the Pajero fully packed. Now this is not gonna be a rig rundown. You guys get to see that next week and you would have seen also a, a brief one uh, last week on how we're all kinda, well, all the gear that we're running. This one is just gonna be how is the gear packed into the cars for two weeks off the grid and also you get to see our plans. So let's jump right into it. So we're going to start off in probably the most important part of the Pajero and that is the back storage system or drawers. So here we have currently missing the fridge. That's currently at home pulling temperature. So anyone looking to go out on big trips like this with fridges, the way that we usually do it is pull the fridges out before the trip, plug them into AC power and get them pulled down to temperature. That's what this one's doing right now. That way your battery system, in my case the Enerdrive 100 amp, is fully charged and it's really not drawing too heavily on it when you're out on the road. If we had a left um, the morning of and the fridge was still trying to pull temperature, it would drain that battery down so fast because it's drawing high amps. This way, the way that we do it now, it's only drawing small amounts, small increments just to stay up to temperature instead of trying to pull down 10 or 12 degrees uh, from hot. So that's what the fridge is doing. So that'll usually sit here and that'll be full. You guys will get to see that as we're gonna be doing meal prep in this video too. And here is the most significant part of it. So in the bottom here, a lot of miscellaneous items, lighters, hammer. We've got the kick-ass shower that goes in the tent, little inverter and just bits and pieces for the compressor. In here is our, it's a camp oven slash frying pan. And in the back, just our cutlery set and um, tongs and utensils and stuff like that. And that's, and right in here will go a little uh, power pack that I take with me up into the rooftop tent to run the lights. And then that also has the capability to jumpstart a vehicle if necessary. Quite important, I think, especially for solo travelers, maybe you're looking at going out solo, to have a way to jumpstart your vehicle if you get stuck in the bush. Just because we know how DC-DC systems work, sometimes your starter battery can get drained if you're not careful. In the top, uh, we've got ourselves all the collapsible items here that are gonna go, for instance, bucket for the shower. We've got containers for water, a dish rack, We've got pegs, a shovel, and this here. So this is gonna be very important later on. This is the kick-ass vacuum sealer. This is gonna be so important for us considering the amount of time that we're spending off grid. So we'll get into this a little bit later on. This is gonna how we're gonna be prepping all of our food with a cryovac. We've got the hose for the air compressor and also a, a um, flat pack fire pit down the bottom there. And just some other general items they're, they're not perfectly packed, but I feel like this is gonna do us, considering we've got two vehicles, only two people in this truck, so um, that's how I've packed that. On top, we'll go the butane cooker. I've got a splitter ax down the side down here that's going to uh, help for firewood, and uh, I'll probably chuck a few other miscellaneous items on top. So, coming into the back here, I've mentioned before looking at potentially next year taking out the rear seats because the way that the drawers are put in, the seats actually, they don't click in right back. So they're, they're kind of just there. So we've rolled them down for this purpose. It's just gonna be me and dad in this car now. So dad's no longer taking the Bravo. Touch more on that later. So it'll just be dad and I in here. So I've got one sleeping bag here. Dad's sleeping bag will go on top. The toolkit on top of the water tank. So the water tank is full with the hose just hanging here. The ladder for the rooftop tent always stays there. It's just on a strap, so quick access. Got some little 12 volt spares here just because I've been having a little bit of issues with it just in case anything goes wrong. I have the capability to fix that there. Got some spare fuses in the back there as well. Air compressor on top of the water tank and over the other side there, 
will sit a console fridge that will have all of our drinks in. So the big fridge in the back is going to be full of mainly food. We might chuck a couple of drinks in there if there's space, but predominantly we're going to be having this the fridge, the console fridge in here, full of drinks. That just means we don't have to open that fridge in the back as often. It's a big drawer and we're trying to just manage our power well. So that's how I set up in the front cab. There's, there's not really anything, just the UHF like normal. So that's how we're packed. So all this is going to have pillows and all that kind of stuff in it luggage and other things and in the back is where the predominantly all the other stuff will go so i think it's packed pretty well and um now that's pretty well how i've packed sleeping up here we're all you know you guys can watch a full rundown on all the touring set up but um i think it's pretty well ready for two weeks it's not that much effort in my case considering a lot of this stuff permanently lives in the vehicle but now let's go over and take a look at jake's nav so now we're over at the nav and this is a much more simple setup compared to mine. So this could be very relevant to some of you guys out there who haven't dropped big dollars on a touring setup, who are preparing to go for a long off-grid trip. So the benefit that Jake and I have is that we can rely sort of on each other and share gear. This is a very important point um, for anyone potentially looking at going with more than one vehicle on a big trip. You guys don't have to be independent, even though it's, it's great to be independent but you can also rely on each other to use each other's gear. That is what we're going to be doing. So prime example of this is Jake's fridge in the nav is going to be used as a permanent freezer. And my fridge is going to be used, well, normally as a fridge. So we're going to work three days of food in my fridge and then we're going to pull it out as we need it out of the freezer. It's going to be cryovac and that is going to basically mean it's going to stay as fresh as possible. So running down Jake's packing in the back of the tub here. So he's got his own cooker over here. Got some chairs, just some awning sidewalls, Max Trax table, the old trusty toolkit, and all clothes and stuff in the back there. So there's a storage container in there. Very simple and very doable. This is very um, relatable, I would say, to a lot of people out there, like I just said, that, that don't want to go out spending huge top dollar on a, uh, a four-wheel drive. So this is all in the back of the tub. Additionally, in here, there will go a few more things. Uh, we're obviously... We're mostly packed. We're not completely packed yet. On the roof of the nav, there will go the swags. So Jake, on the roof over here, is just running a simple 2.5 meter awning on this small roof rack. So up here, will go the swag. So we've got Jake's swag, Tomsey's swag, and Dad's swag will probably all go up here as well as a couple of other miscellaneous items, maybe some firewood and stuff like that, will all go up here. It's really good having that available roof space. As you see, I don't have um, any available roof space with the rooftop tent. That's something that I had to consider when putting that on, that I'd no longer have any roof space available. One, for weight reasons, and two, just because that takes up the whole space on the roof. Again, another benefit of having two vehicles going away. In the back now, we have Jake's dual battery system. So. He's running a Red Arc BCDC 25 recent edition. So before we were running the kick-ass isolator in Jake's nav and just decided due to some other reasons, um, voltage issues, that we'd pop this in. So a long story short, the alternator on the old YD25 was not pulling um, enough to keep this battery sufficiently charged running the fridge. It was basically giving it a float charge constantly. So the old Red Arc charger out of the Pajero that's it. So it's an old Red Arc BCDC 25 and what that essentially is doing is forcing the alternator to work in the nav. So it's now putting out the right voltage to keep Jake's battery down and it's, well, it was a very relatively easy install and it's beneficial. So it's doing the job. So forcing the alternator to work in this case has meant that it's now getting the proper amount of charge and it was a relatively good budget system, very easily wired in. Uh, we might even do a detailed rundown of the issues that Jake was having before, how we resolve them and how we're going to deal with them if they pop back up again, which they shouldn't. So in the back, see organizers, really, really handy to have. It's something I don't have. A uh, little 50 litre fridge there. This is going to be used as a freezer. Console fridge on the other side for drinks. So you notice that we're both doing that. We've both gone out and fronted the money for console fridges and... That's because we really want to be opening our big fridges as little as possible to make our power last longer. So those console fridges, they draw absolutely bugger all. And there's nice space, nice amount of space for drinks in there. You can just keep filling them up. So we're both going to be doing that. And they'll run off the vehicle. So they won't even run off the 12 volt system at all. 
they'll just be running off the alternator basically and keeping it nice and cool for our drinks and all the food will go in the big fridges that's something i think if you guys are planning on going out for longer periods of time that you may need to look at is um, alternatives for your drinks it may cost you a bit extra but in the long term even if you decide to invest in a console fridge and that, let's say you go out on a day trip that means you don't need to take your big fridge you've just got that nice little console fridge but in our application we're using it for drinks keeping the food and drinks separate so we can avoid opening the big fridges a lot saving power is probably a um, not a necessity but it's definitely a great advantage to have i think or we think all right so now we've switched over the other side of the car so you can see this a bit better here's that console fridge i was talking about and there's just some other miscellaneous items that'll go on the floor here so we'll have bags and clothes and other stuff like that it's kind of hard to find a permanent space for stuff like that in the in cars especially even on long trips you notice both of the cars there are instances where things are just kind of chucked in there and we'll work with that throughout the trip uh, not everything has to have its uh, permanent spot but you know as i'm sure everybody just kind of does that sometimes so jake also does have his own compressor that he'll be taking with him as well so we'll have two of those uh running for this trip and that's that's pretty much it um that how we're setting up for two weeks um really not sure if we've done enough preparation or if we're over prepped or not we'll see when we go i guess and uh, i hope that you guys got something out of this part of the video the main purpose was to show you the two different setups and see how i pack and see how jake packs and maybe you guys can relate to one or the other and also show you that we're obviously sharing gear it's, it's quite a, uh, a good benefit to have to be able to share gear for long periods of time so now we've got double the storage essentially we're relying on each other we'll probably save a fair bit of money and space going out for two weeks the cars are not over packed if you get what I mean. Sometimes I've seen people, they pack the car to the rafters to go off road for two weeks. That's really not what we're doing. So hopefully you guys got some insight to that and can take away from this part of the video. That's the main purpose, like I said. So you guys can see what we've done and actually take away from it. And if you're planning on going away yourself and have similar setups. Anyway, now we're gonna go to the shops and then you guys are gonna get to see the food and how we're portioning and packing that for two weeks off of the grid. Woo! Flexin! <laughs> Mask on, boys. We're on the hunt for a pink duffel bag for Tomsey. Doesn't pink? have one. Yeah, pink one. Yeah, alright. With kitties and stuff on it. Yep. So we're in Target. Oops. Mmm. Write it. <laughs> so this is a double. We can get some stuff over that day. Is there any bigger ones? Oh, perfect. So Tomsey didn't like the pink handbag, so now <laughs> we're gonna go find him a bigger one. So, I've taken the GoPro into JB Hi-Fi, so I wonder how long it is until they think I stole it. So we just went in and got ourselves a new 64 gigabyte SD card because the GoPro Hero 10, everyone's saying hi, <laughs> the GoPro Hero 10 uses a lot of storage space. We're not going to have a lot of opportunity to back it up, so now we're going to go find strand bags for Tomsey. 45 bucks. 45 bucks. Didn't even make it to strand bags. Is there a pink one? It's bigger. Yeah, Puma. Puma, pink one? That's the one where you got it. Be. Come on. You've got to buy the pink one. Surely. Yeah, surely. surely. Come <laughs> on, bro. <laughs> yes, yes. Alright, <laughs> let's go get it. Good size, good size, good size. Sure. Good size. Yeah. See, that that's what Tommy's getting for two weeks. And 60 smacks. 60 smacks. Right out. Looks good. Looks the goods. This fresh cop. So I'm gonna pack two weeks worth of clothes into this. Yep. Fresh. Yes, sir. Nice. <laughs> Price picker. Uh, that's gonna be our drinking water, Jackson. Yeah. Okay, that is our the way we're gonna live. Oh, baby wipes. Yeah, pink one. No. <laughs> I'll get pink one. 
No. Pink. Is there a difference? Mm. No. Oh, it helps to get this nappy rash. Yeah, get this one. <laughs> yeah, get him some noodles. Who's him? Get it. Oh. Do we all like this flavor? What is it? Chicken? chicken? Yeah. Ooh, uh, Wait, that's a shit brand. Yeah, that's a shit brand, yeah. yeah. Oh, where's the one? Five. A few. Got the whole one. Wait, why don't we just get <laughs> Good toss. Do we want everyone to just want to get the packet on? No, I don't want the packet. No. <laughs> no, that. <laughs> sure, let's go. <laughs> no, they're, no. Only, they're only a buck fifty. Yeah, well, if we were splitting this three ways, I reckon I would be broke. Same. So how many of these do we want? Charlie's getting full now. Chockies. Chocker block. We're going to have to go to BCF and get another draw. Yeah, we'll have to, I might have the impulse buy another draw. I sneezed in my mask and now I had to flip it the other way. Oh, barbecue and tomato sauce. Yes, sir. That'll get mad if it's not the Master Foods one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Make sure well, it's So we've got to go get a Master Foods for Dad. Big Bill coming. Next level adventures. Really taking this, taking this adventure to the next level here. <laughs> taking this shopping bill to the next level, I should say. Isn't he, man? salt and pepper. So my chef duties have been taken over. Chef Tomzy is whipping up. Very good. Mix these together, you get a very nice uh, taste on your chicken and steak. Even yeah. anything, to be honest, any meat, these two go absolutely fucking well together. So we're gonna add this to the next level bill. Oh yeah. Worth it. Keen. Yeah. Make sure you subscribe, guys. Watch the whole video because um, this shop's gonna be massive. Oh, oh. Need the ad money. <laughs> I tried to call him, but um, someone came in the door. Yeah, just get the ladies oh, out. That's some next level shopping right there. Are we done? Well, I hope you enjoyed that next level shop. Now we're going to take all of this home and show you how we're going to prep it. It's pretty interesting. So now I've done the shop, it's all here and we're going to be using this guy. So I mentioned at the start of the video that this was going to come in handy for us from a packing for this trip. So basically all of the meat right now in the big massive trays and everything like that uh, isn't really going to work for us when we're trying to pack for two weeks here and we're trying to aim not to resupply. So we probably could but we just thought heck we'd, we'd try and uh, and rough it out see if we could fit all two weeks worth of stuff in the car. So currently we've already got a lot of the food cryovac and it's really shrunk it down and made it more manageable for space. So we've got Jake's 50 litre fridge which is going to be a freezer and my 80 litre which is going to be a fridge. The reason that we've done it that way is because this big 80 litre, you can see it over there behind me, just takes way too much time and power to keep drawing and um, to draw down the temperature, sorry. So we're going to use it that way. We're planning to at least have three days worth of food in the main fridge and keep the rest in Jake's fridge. So we'll work that. So everything pretty much except the first three days worth will be frozen and then we'll do it that way. So we've been using this, the Kick-Ass Vacuum Sealer. A lot of brands do these, they are pretty cheap. And I think that they're well worth it when you're planning a big trip like this. So literally two weeks. So um, definitely worth investing in one of these. So we're going to unpack all of this and we'll show you uh, what it all looks like once it's packed and ready to go into the car.
So there we have it, all of that food that we just bought, we can cry back down into portions. So now instead of having to pull the whole thing out, if we kept it in the original tray, we've portioned it all down so that we can literally pull it out in uh, sections and this will all be frozen now, ready to go. And so, um, yeah, it makes it a lot more manageable and it saves a lot of space. And we can also, if we don't uh, use all of this on the road, we can actually reseal it to save it for later if we want to. So that is how we've prepared all of our stuff. Now, obviously all of this will be managed and split up throughout the vehicles as well. But that's the main thing that I wanted to show you guys with the preparation is the cryobacking of all of our meat and how we manage and portion it and everything like that. So I think it's really important if you're going on a big trip to look at investing in something like this because um, if you're out there and there are no shops or no supplies nearby, this can be really beneficial having it frozen cryovac so it stays fresher for longer. So a little update, last minute kind of decision that we've made. So the old Bravo, when we took it out to Lithgow the last time, broke the transfer case and basically means that the full drive in that old truck does not work as well there's there's been a few other issues that we've had with it that basically means that we're not going to be keeping the vehicle so on that vehicle there are brand new 31 inch Goodyear Wranglers and what we've decided to do today is actually put the old tires on the Bravo or the, the new tires on the Bravo onto Jake's Navara so he's got those brand new Goodyear Wranglers on for this trip so we're just gonna just test them out and see if they fit first and if they do then we'll go ahead and uh, change them over and if well they don't then uh, then they'll stay on the Bravo or we'll work something out there but uh, it'd be really good if they did fit because then uh, Jake would have some nice tires to head away with anyway a little bit of a last minute thing but I guess some last minute preparations are always necessary Alrighty, so here we have the old tyres that originally came on the Bravo when we bought it before we changed it over. What we're doing here is we're just testing to see if the stud pattern will fit on the Navara before we actually go removing the tyres off the Bravo. If they do, that's great. Then we'll chuck them on Jake's nav and then we'll be putting the original tyres back on the Bravo uh, ready to be sold. And then uh, Jake's tyres will be pretty much spares. So uh, hopefully they fit, but this is the easiest way to do it. So we don't cause too much of a mess. So let's get into it. So they do fit on, so now it's time to uh, change over to the good years that are on the Bravo, so looking forward to that. So now we got the good years on the Navara. It's looking pretty good. So we'll see how they go throughout the trip. I think that uh, Jake's gonna love it. Got a much better tire on there now. So that was a bit of a last minute preparation. So now I guess we're gonna show you what everyone's been waiting for. The anticipated trip itinerary and route that we're gonna be taking for these two weeks and um, what our plan Bs are and if we're ahead and behind schedule. So we'll show you guys that now in just a moment. Alrighty, so now guys are gonna come the part that I guess everybody's been waiting for, the trip plan or trip itinerary for this two week adventure. Now we have allowed a lot of time for the things that we've got on the list. So whether we will be ahead of schedule, which we do have a plan for, or behind schedule, which we also have a plan for, I really don't know. So we're just gonna be roughly following the itinerary and what we get done, we get done. What we don't, we'll leave it for next time. So I use this book here. The Four Drive Treks Close to Sydney book 
uh, for a majority of the inspiration for this trip. So it's a lot of the treks that are in there as well as a mixture of some Google Maps and other stuff like that. I didn't use any full drive specific map mapping software besides this book to plan this trip. So to start off this trip, if you have the book, we're looking at trek number six. So to start off the trip, we are heading to an all too familiar area in behind Lithgow at Nunes. However, we're starting off the trip at a destination which we haven't been to before, which is at the head of the Zigzag Railway. So we've been in before from the Nunes campground up Walgan Road. However, we've never entered from this section, which is in Chifley, I believe up State Mine Hill Road. And we'll be heading straight into the Glowworm Tunnel. We'll do that again for you guys and show those who haven't seen it. And then we'll head back down and out to the Lost City. And then the plan for this day is going to be to camp at the end of Sunnyside Ridge Road. So I, I believe that we've allowed a lot of time for this as it's, um, you can pretty much get the majority of that region done, the main attractions in a day, that being the Glowworm Tunnel and the Lost City. So those are the plan, that's the plan for the first day. Now the second day, we've allowed to explore the Nunes region further because there are tons of tracks that we haven't actually done out there that we'd like to just go down and explore, see where they lead. And then we'll be ending that trip camp this that night camping at the head of the Blackfellows Hand Trail, um, which is just on Walgan Road there. So usually we would enter from that way and go down into the Lost City and come back out and head up Walgan Road to the Nunes Campground. We won't be doing that this time. There's plenty of videos on the Nunes Campground um, on the channel. We will not be going there this time. So we'll be camping at the head of the trail and then on the third day, we'll be going into an area we've never been before. And if you have the book, we're moving over to track 25. So track 25 in the book is the Gardens of Stone National Park. And that is literally directly links up to the end of Blackfellow's Hand Trail that we're going to be staying at the end of. And then you'll be heading up and we'll be going out into the Bilebone Gap area through up the Walgan State Forest and the Ben Bullen State Forest, through the Gardens of Stone National Park, and then we'll be coming out at the end at Ben Bullen, just near the railway crossing there um, on the Castlereagh Highway, and then from there we will be heading up into Capertee. So once we're in Capertee, we're going to be moving on to Trek 11 in this book, and we're going to be heading from Capertee down Upper Turon Road, uh, and then down into the Turon National Park. So in this book, it doesn't actually have any details on the Turon National Park, but it is, um, it is it is in the area here. And we'll be camping in either the Diggins or Woolshed Flat Campground down in the Turon National Park for that one. So for the fourth day of the trip, the plan roughly will be, and this is where Track 11 is relevant, to go back up up a Turon Road and then we will be heading down uh, into Sunny Corner basically and then from Sunny Corner um, we'll be heading into Kelso and Bathurst we'll stop and get fuel and then we'll be heading over to track 22 so for track 22 in this book is going to take us from Kelso all the way up to Hill End via an alternative route that is not the bridal track so for many years now the bridal track the direct route from Bathurst to Hill End has been closed. So how do we get around that? By taking the Root Hog Crossing track. So that is gonna be the plan from Kelso. Kelso is just outside of Bathurst. So basically from Bathurst, we'll be going up following track 22, all the way up into and around the Hill End village area. So if necessary, we'll find a camp spot somewhere along there. And uh, if there's still time, however, and we do make it into Hill End, we will be camping at Little Wallaby Rocks and then doing the Little Wallaby Rocks track and coming out near Safala. On the sixth day, if necessary, we'll be making our way from Safala or Hill End, whichever one we end up in, into Mudgy for a restock and, you know, just to wash some clothes and other stuff like that. That's only if necessary. If we can avoid doing that, we will. And then from there, we'll be going from there to either the Big River or Spring Gully Campground in the Goulburn River National Park. Now that's the plan. If we are ahead of time here, this is a little asterisk kind of thing. If we are ahead of time here at Hill End, instead of heading into Mudgee and, and doing all those things, 
we'll be heading down Long Point Road out to Orange and doing some camping in the Ofa region. And then from Ofa, we'll basically be heading around and then back up into uh, either we'll go down. If we're really ahead of time, we'll head down and camp at Mount Canobolus. If we're kind of back on track, we'll be heading from Ofa then to the Goulburn River National Park and back on track. And then from the Goulburn River National Park, whichever one we decide to do, we'll be heading up from there, a big trek up to Scone and then into the Barrington Tops National Park. And from the Barrington Tops National Park, that is trek number... So moving over to trek number 18, when we get to basically Moon and Flat, that is where we'll be following this trek. So it's quite a detailed one. And Barrington Tops this is kind of a rough plan because it's a very popular spot this time of year. So we really don't know uh, where we're going to end up staying. That's why we have so many options. So basically, uh, we would like... Best case scenario to camp at Little Murray. I love the Little Murray campground and it's the one with the most open space and the best chance of seeing wild brumbies. So that's where we'd like to stay. And then waking up there at Little Murray on the eighth day of the trip, we would head down to Junction Pools if it's still accessible down the Barrington Trail. Check that out and then head back up and uh, do the Thunderbolts Trail up to the Manning River campground. So we had a trip to Barrington Tops planned a while ago where we planned to do this this rough itinerary that had to be cancelled due to lockdowns so now we're pretty much cramming all these trips that we wanted to do into a big one so if we can get up the thunderbolts trail to the manning river campground that's great we'll camp there if not uh, we'll do some more exploring in the area and then we'll head up just the standard track the trail into um, the manning river campground anyway So here is where we have a little bit of a, a break again. Asterix, if we're ahead of time, we will do something else. So here, I know I'm very well aware that the road still down the Barrington Trail into Gloucester is closed. So we will need to find an alternative route around that. So here is where we would be heading from Manning River out back onto the there's a little back road that will take us around the closure and up into the cells river region now this is only for ahead of time and, and we probably need to allow a couple of days for this um, and i haven't necessarily planned anything for this because there i've not, not even looked at any maps just got a bit of advice from uh, steve at mud ducks four wheel drive touring who said if you're ahead of time in that region and need to go the long way around, head up into the Sells River region, do it all through there, and that'll bring us out up near Bellingen and Coffs Harbour. And basically from there, we'll be heading back down the coast. So if that happens, uh, we'll be going back down the coast to Dungog, and we'll be heading over to trek number three. So once we've come out, regardless of the way that we go, and we end up in Dungog, whether we take the long way up into the Sells River region, or we just go back around the long way from Scone, or down somewhere else, we'll, we will end up in Dungog either way. And from Dungog, we will be heading up into the Chichester State Forest and just doing a few little tracks and camps up in there. Um, we'd like to camp at a few different places in here, but ideally Chichester Dam would be the ideal place to camp because it's going to be hot, we can have a swim there and everything else. And then from Chichester, we're going to go back into Dungog and then out to Singleton. And that is a trek in this book, I believe. Yep, so once we are done in Dungog and headed down to Singleton, we're going to be going to Trek 7. So we'll be going up and visiting Lake Sinclair, probably having a swim there or just chilling there, having lunch for the day or something like that. It'll probably be a pretty chill day and then from there... We'll head straight up north into Mount Royal National Park and find a camp in the Mount Royal region. From Singleton, then once we're finished up in there, we'll be heading down to Singleton, down into Curry Curry, and then out onto either Redhead or Stockton Beach. Uh, we'll assess which one is the best option, which one is more busy, less busy. If we can camp on the beach, we will. If not, then we'll be spending most of the day out there and then either head into a, a free camp within the area or up into the Wadigan Mountains. 
So the next day, if we decide to camp on the beach, we'll be then heading from either Redhead or Stockton Beach up to the Wadigan Mountains. And we'll be exploring the Wadigan Mountains a little bit and we'll be camping somewhere around the Heat and Lookout area or one of the main campgrounds down in there. Really undecided that will all depend on the time and uh, how packed everything is. So when we head up into the Wadigan Mountains, there is an entire trek in the book on that as well. Trek number 13 has a detailed look of the Wadigan Mountains and this is going to come into play now. So when we camp in the Wadigans, we're going to be making our way from the Wadigan Mountains down to the Basin Campground and from there we can head up to Wollombi. So once we get into Wollombi, we're going to then flip over to trek number four. So trek number four in the book is the Convict Trail. So once we're in Wollombi, we're going to be following the Yango Track and Howes Valley Trail up onto the Putty Road, basically doing all the Convict Trail stuff all around here, which is, and down Wiseman Ferries Way as well, if we can, if we have the time for that. And so once we're on the Putty Road, we'll then be following another track, trek number nine. So trek number nine starts a little bit south from where we get onto the Putty Road from the Convict Trail, a little bit south. And basically it's the Hunter Range track. So it goes all the way around. There's this huge big loop that we'll be doing. Hopefully camping somewhere around like Sheepskin Hut area and uh, exploring down there. So basically once we complete the Hunter Range track, which is trek number nine, that will bring us to the end of our trip. So we'll be on the Putty Road, which means that we can head straight back south down to Windsor Ways and pretty much end the trip. So if we are short on time for any of those trips, basically they are all somewhere on the line are pretty close to a highway that we can exit out of early if necessary. If we have extra time on our hands, then we'll be heading down the Weenie Creek, Burrow Creek area, or maybe even spend a little bit of time back up in the areas that we were before, maybe an extra day here or there. So it will really depend. I feel like I've been quite very generous with the amount of time that I've given to each of these locations, but keep in mind we are filming. So, um, Filming obviously takes up a lot of time with all of these things and we're also looking at relaxing, you know, we're, we're not looking at rushing. So if we're ahead of time, that's great. If we're behind time, you know, so be it. And if we're on time, well, that's, that's great as well. So uh, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button to stay tuned for this trip. So this is it. These are our last minute preparations that we did today. So put the new tires on the nav, we went shopping try to give you a little bit of a different style behind the scenes video because I've never done one for such a big trip like this and it's probably good information for people uh, potentially gearing up for a trip like this if it's just you or if it's you and some mates to see how we do it so maybe you can take some notes away from that you know sharing uh, space throughout vehicles is often something that people don't do I've noticed and it's something that you can very much benefit from and save money we split the shop between all of us we all went shopping together save a lot of money as well so um definitely hope you guys learned something from this video uh like i said this entire trip was planned pretty much from this book four drive treks close to sydney uh, you probably would have seen a lot of b-roll from all of the uh pages and stuff for each different section of the trip so um really looking forward to it now we are literally two days away from departing and we're all very excited and i hope you guys are too so make sure you smash the subscribe button and stay keen you can check out all the preparation videos to do with this trip in the playlist as we're gearing up for two weeks off-road anyway guys i hope you enjoyed this video and as always we will see you in the next adventure